I always love hearing about industry news and I'm not sure if this is too much of like a niche topic because some of the things I'll cover maybe aren't that interesting to everybody. But one of my favorite YouTubers is Cassie Thorpe and she does sort of these news updates on the fashion industry. So she's like a luxury fashion YouTuber. And they've become my favorite thing to watch just hearing about things that I don't really know that much about. But, but anyway, I thought I'd copy her and see how this goes, see if you guys find it interesting. I'm really not sure. So I'm just going to get straight into the headlines and I have six of them. I would say this round is a little bit more regulatory leaning, but um, I guess we'll see how this goes moving forward. Let's start with sunscreen and the updated standards coming out of Australia. As everyone is probably aware, Australia does have some of the more rigorous sunscreen regulations in the world. The updated guidelines aren't like a huge change. They're just creating a little bit more of a universal testing requirement with other countries, like more uniformity and consistency between regions. And they're just doing this by embracing some of the existing ISO standards um, so that various countries in the world are now using the same standard. This ideally will help to improve repeatability of SPF test results, just so that there's less chance of variation. You know, you might have seen some of the headlines around where like a consumer testing group tests an SPF, it's a different rating to what's on the label. Part of that might be related to different ISO standards and different ways that they're actually testing sunscreen. So by having more countries using the same process, that will hopefully mean that wherever a sunscreen is tested, we're getting, we're achieving the same SPF result. Australia will still deviate a little bit from other countries. For example, the water resistance requirements are still going to be more, still going to be more strong stringent for the Australian requirement. But I think overall, any steps towards a global standard is great. Originally, I thought some of these updates might make it easier for brands to enter the Australian market. Um, you might be aware that it is actually a bit challenging for brands to sell SPF products that are available overseas in Australia. But unfortunately, other barriers of entry related to inactive ingredients and even manufacturing facilities probably won't, um, probably probably means we won't see a change in that anytime soon. Number two is that celebrities are back as brand ambassadors. When I was first getting into skincare, celebrity ads were everywhere. Pretty much every brand had a celebrity as a face. I felt like for a while there was a big drop off and brands focused a lot more on social media. But lately there has been a bit of an influx back to celebrities as faces. And this might be a little bit of an unpopular opinion, but I'm actually really happy about it. There's this whole thing, I guess, on social media where everybody wants everything to be relatable. I actually prefer advertising to be a little bit more inspirational or aspirational. And I think celebrities are able to achieve that type of advertising just really well that you don't get on social media. There's just a level of like glamour, a level of extraness that probably isn't possible otherwise. My favorite recent example is Margot Robbie joining Chanel Beauty. Margot has become such a big name, but she has this effortless vibe that I think really matches Chanel really well and and truly like a classic beauty. I just watched her new Chanel number no. five ad with Jacob Elordi and I think that was such a well done ad like I loved it it was like a mini movie and again these are things that you don't really get um, with social media now I'm not saying brands should throw away relatability or throw away social media it's just I think you can do both you know I think celebrities are great for brand awareness and just to position the brand kind of where they like where they aspire to be maybe and then everything else around that can can be the more relatable content like how things actually apply how things actually work that's what social media is for but the actual introduction of a product, I'm totally on board with celebrities doing that part. I also think the ads of Sydney Sweeney for Laneige were super cute. I don't think the fit of Sydney and Laneige made as much sense as Margot for Chanel, but they were still really cute ads. Sabrina Carpenter working with Redken at the moment obviously makes sense as well because she's so well known for her hair on tour. Jenny from Blackpink promoting Hera out of Korea was the first time I ever heard of that brand. And Viola Davis joining L'Oreal and promoting their Midnight Serum just added a certain level of like power and credence and class to that campaign. Anyway, all of this is to say, I think there's just room to have 
have this sort of aesthetic of glam again that has been missing a little bit from the beauty industry. Next up, we have Olive Young, who has highlighted some differences between buyers in different markets. Olive Young is one of the biggest retailers for K-beauty, and they released a trend report indicating how buyers from different markets have different preferences. Specifically, they mentioned the US, UK, and Japan, which I assume would be their biggest international markets, hence why they've been isolated. According to the article, customers from the United States are mainly interested in sunscreen, and that makes total sense, right, considering the more limited options that people in the US have regarding filters and textures. For customers out of the UK, and very interestingly, the main category was dealing with skin texture. Things like VT Regal Shot were a key product. And for Japan, the main thing Olive Young observed was interest in other categories beyond just skincare. So it seems like the Japanese customer became more aware of hair care, body supplements coming out of Korea. Now, I believe that data came from the Olive Young website where most countries get diverted to kind of an, in, an international version of the website. But Olive Young also analyzed international tourist data from physical store locations. And in store, it turns out international buyers were mainly focused on newly emerged brands. I think of brands like Torrid and a few others. And that makes sense, again, just considering the amount of social media saturation they have more in the West Western country. Remaining in Korea for this next article, the Korea Consumer Agency has called out several retailers. These include AliExpress, Timu, Temu, and Shein. And this is all around safety concerns from some of the products they were selling. I think authenticity is probably a conversation in skincare that we don't have as much as we should. Obviously, everybody knows about like fake fashion and that kind of thing. It's an important headline and a good reminder that we should all only be shopping from super reputable retailers. In this particular article, they addressed how, how the KCA tested some essential oils and pet care and that many of these products fail domestic safety standards. Close to 90% of the oils tested contained undeclared allergens and two of the 19 oils they tested even contained banned substances. The KCA has also previously done testing on color cosmetics from some of these websites and they even and they found things like heavy metals and tar in these products. So again, just buy from reputable brands, reputable retailer. Number five, fragrances in the EU. The EU has really robust regulator regulatory framework. Personally speaking, there are some situations where I think they're a little bit overzealous, but I guess ultimately it's all in the best interest of consumer safety moving forward. One key update they've made is regarding fragrance allergens and the list of allergens that has to be declared on a label has moved up from 26 all the way to 56. This is great for transparency, of course. I'm just a bit concerned this could lead to a little bit of extra fear mongering around fragrance and allergens overall. Hopefully people do realize that this updated list is just about transparency and expanding the discussion around allergenic potential. But the allergenic potential is really only applicable to people who are allergic to these ingredients. For the general population, these ingredients are still totally fine and the updated list really adds nothing significant. It's just about a more well-rounded picture. Number six, blue light. I think most of us know this by now, but claims surrounding blue light in topical skincare, or like specifically the blue light emitted from screens, has very questionable and limited research around it. Truth in Advertising have issued a report basically challenging a few of the brands that are still making these claims and indicating that these brands basically have no evidence to show that their product does anything against blue light from screens, or if a product would even need to address blue light from screens in the first place. It's pretty interesting how the whole blue light phenomenon took off. But luckily there were several social media science communicators that were able to shut it down pretty quick. I mean, I still remember Lab Muffin basically single-handedly destroying this myth with like one post. Anyway, they're all the headlines I have to discuss today. Again, I'm not sure if they were interesting. These aren't necessarily super new. They're just a bit of a collection from the last few months. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Maybe the next time I do this, I can focus a little bit more on just on actual like brand headlines or maybe business related stuff. I'm not sure. We'll see how this develops over time. Thanks and <laughs> thank you. I'll see you next time.